Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Nick Parr Show. That's what I've named it, and I'm here with special guests from Temple University, also the former voice of the Philadelphia 76ers, and many other broadcasting gigs. Mark Zumoff. Hello, you know, Mark. I, I never called you Nick. When I had you as a student, it was Nicholas, because I like N-I-C-K-L-A-U-S, like the spelled. famous guy. Yeah. Uh, now, you and maybe my mom, I think, might be the only people that call me that. Not your father? I think he just calls me Nick. Oh, I've, I've never heard him call me Nick. What, what if he's angry with you? Then what? Then maybe, yeah, maybe he <laughs> might go. He might go middle name too. So, um, yeah, we'll get started here. Um, so obviously going to Temple in your time at Temple, um, did you know hundred percent that you wanted to be a broadcaster going in? Pretty much, uh, there was some trepidation because in my household, um, steady work sometimes was an issue. Uh, my father um, sometimes went from job to job, and because of that, my mother grew up fearful that I wanted to go into a business where it was tough to break into. And so while I did major in what was then radio, TV, film at Temple, uh, I um, was prepared for a plan B, I guess, all along. But for some reason, I was able to break into the business shortly after graduating and made my way as uh, the TV voice of the Sixers. And even as I sit here nearly three years retired, I can't even believe it. I did it. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, So at Temple, what experience as a broadcaster did you get? Anything? A ton. We had the opportunity. First, I was based uh, largely through my first few years at the Ambler campus. And there was a small radio station there. I'm not sure anybody had ever listened to it in the time that I was there, but it gave us a chance to get reps. We would take a reel to reel tape recorder to different events. I would do play by play at uh, intramural basketball games or ice hockey games or what have you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, increasingly, as I uh, reached the upper classes, junior and senior, I would work at WRTI. Okay. And that's when uh, the radio station was owned by the university. And there was an evening report for half an hour from six to six 30. And, they did sports from quarter after to 25 after, and once a week, that 10-minute segment was mine. Yeah, so after Temple, um, I did some research, and you were broadcasting at Princeton for a little bit. How was that coming straight out of college? I guess you did a little bit stuff before, but then going to Princeton and calling football and basketball games there. It was really cool, Nick, because to that point, I'd spent about three, four, five years as a radio news guy, and I was yeah. prepared to go into news. And then it's what I tell everybody when you're in the business, there's no substitute for having your foot in the door. And I was at a radio station in Princeton doing news. And I'd heard sometime during the week, it was football season, that they fired the announcer who was doing football and, ra and uh, basketball for the radio station. And so I went into the station manager's office and I told him I could do play by play. He said, fine, you got the gig because they were desperate for somebody. Yeah. And that's how I began the transition from news to sports. And you 100% wanted to do sports mm -hmm. coming, not news? I would have been happy doing news. I found my way um, it, through that part of the industry, and I liked it. I enjoyed it. I liked breaking stories. I liked reporting. I liked getting out there and meeting people and going through complicated issues. But once the sports bug hit and I was able to make the transition, there was no turning back. Okay. So after Princeton, Rob Grossman, I believe his name is, helped you get a play-by-play -play gig with the Philadelphia Fever. And that was of the major indoor soccer league. So going from Princeton to soccer or changing sports, I guess you did. How was it changing sports? Did you adapt well? I, I think I, I did because as a kid and even at Temple, just whether it was at Temple or messing around as a kid, I think I broadcast, quote unquote, almost every sport, turning yeah. the sound down to the TV and doing games into a tape recorder. And so uh, that actually was a big break for me because I did their games for two years. It was an indoor soccer team, and they were on a channel called Prism. Yeah. And Prism uh, had a great formula. They did pro and college sports and movies just like HBO. And it was a premium service. And um because they saw my work there doing fever games on prism they hired me to do movie announcements and then eventually uh to be the halftime guy for the sixers and i went up from there yeah and then i believe the fever franchise went under 
after you were calling games there for a little bit. So did you have to sort of scramble to find something new or did you have something lined up? That's a great question. And I'm trying to remember, I think I did freelancing for a while at KYW news radio. I think, um, well, now AM radio is virtually obsolete, but then 560 AM was, uh, WFIL radio. They were a country station. They hired me to do news for a while. So, you know, I managed to stay in the business and make money using my voice. Yeah. So, and then you started doing hockey games, filling in for Gene Hart and Mike Emmerich. How was it filling in for two legends now, like at the time, filling in for those two guys doing hockey games? In retrospect, I can't believe that I did it because those are two of the four guys on my Mount Rushmore. And I remember filling in for Gene and how surreal it was at the time that there I am sitting in the upper reaches of the spectrum, uh, sitting in the press box, getting ready to call a game, not unlike the games that I heard on the radio for so many years done by Gene and, of course, Mike Emmerich as well. So it was a privilege. It was something that I took very seriously. And it was really, even before doing games for the Sixers, it was my first big break into doing uh, uh, play-by-play that was of great significance. Yeah, so um, when you received the call that you were offered the job to be the voice of the Sixers, I mean, what was going through your head? I mean, it must have been a rush of emotions. Like nothing I've ever experienced. I just remember getting the call. I was in an office at the Spectrum, and I just remember walking outside to my car and not remembering mm-hmm. that I actually walked to my car. I didn't yeah. even know how I got there. <laughs> and then just sitting there in the front seat before driving home, saying to myself, wow, it's finally happened. Yeah, uh, yeah. there was uh, an extended period of time, I think, of uh, disbelief until – you know, it got real. We got closer to the season. Yeah. Then, of course, eventually I started doing games. Now, going into your first season, were you nervous or were you ready to go? I think a healthy combination of both. I think my time had come. I spent 13 years as the halftime guy, and it helped me a great deal acquiring a great base of knowledge of the NBA, becoming familiar with the players, the game, the X's and O's, developing sources. But by the same token, like anything else, there's some trepidation when you do something of a grand nature for the first time. You know, the expression, be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. There was maybe a little bit of that, but it's pretty much like any kind of nervousness that people might have before they go on the air, be it radio or TV, that once you are on the air, any nervousness goes away. And for me, I think... um, It was true for me that season. Yeah, so in your first four years, they never surpassed, I was calling me, never surpassed 31 wins. I think you should get that. I think you should. (laughs) My mom? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'll get it. I'll call her back. Um, In your first four years, in 31 wins or less. So starting as a new broadcaster for the Sixers, how was it to keep the games entertaining? Because it couldn't be that fun to watch a 31 or less win team. So I had to figure out how to keep people interested with the team not performing particularly well. And I soon discovered that if the team acquired a new player, well, that was somebody we could focus on and talk about him for several games. Uh, The NBA is a league full of stars. And when we played a team that had stars on it, the Lakers, the Celtics, and who knows who back Mm -hmm. in the day, um, you could talk about those teams and those players and uh, sort of deflect away from the fact that you weren't that good. And then on the rare occasion that the team did perform well, well, you just got into the game and, yeah. you know, hopefully they would keep it close or maybe actually even win. Yeah, so the player who was exciting that I think you would be talking about when you were starting out was Allen Iverson. So I'm, I assume you're a fan of the Sixers? Oh, yeah, growing yeah. up, absolutely. So as a broadcaster and a fan – how excited were you to start calling games for Allen Iverson or not for Allen Iverson, but Allen Iverson being on the team for us, because he was the top pick in some ways he was seen as a savior. And the feeling then was that with Jerry Stackhouse mm-hmm. and Iverson in the backcourt, it was a backcourt that the Sixers could have as a couple of all-stars for the next 10 or so years. It didn't work out that way. And eventually Stackhouse got traded, but, Iverson was 
and still is to this day a very unique player, a guy who yeah. may or may not have been six feet, 165 pounds maybe, and played the game in an era that was very physical, not like today where they've uh, allowed offensive players a lot more rain, but um, there was a there was an opportunity to see a player who had a very unique playing style and did some amazing things on the floor. Yeah, so calling games in 2000 to 2001, that season, obviously you didn't know they are going to make it to the finals, but watching Allen go through his MVP year and Dikembe with the defensive player of the year, was that one of your more favorite years, calling games? Uh, if not the favorite, when you consider, oh, and by the way, Larry Brown was coach of the year, yeah. Aaron McKee's sixth man of the year, and it was a very unlikely group in that Iverson was really the only bona fide all-star and the four other starters, save for Dikembe Mutombo, who came later in the year, were really not all-stars. It's not to take away from the role that they played, but the type of team that Larry Brown and Billy King assembled around Iverson ended up being the one team that he got to the finals. They were uh, physical. They were defensive oriented. They individually, they did not need the ball. And it was a great opportunity for Iverson to do his thing, to break guys down and to have the ball in his hands as much as possible. Yeah. So after that year for the next 12 or I guess 16 years, they didn't make it out of the second round. And from four years from, I believe, 2011 to 2014 would, is what I consider the worst years of Sixers basketball that I have watched. Hmm. And obviously the 10 and 72 team was also included in there. So I'm going to circle back to the question I asked before. Can you make those games entertaining at all? I guess if they want a game, that was like a celebration in the city. So here's the thing. First of all, even if it's a 10-win team, there are tens of thousands of people who would want to be the voice of a 10-win NBA yeah. team. Knowing that there'd be other seasons, knowing that it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, there are more U.S. senators than there are people who do NBA games on TV. And so I never forgot any of that. And that spurred me to be professional. That and the fact that every two weeks, I would look at my bank account, I was getting paid. And so what you do is, like we said before, whether it's players on the other team or new guys you get on your team or whatever it happens to be, you do what you can to make the games exciting or yeah. at least not necessarily exciting, but certainly interesting. Yeah. So another Sixer player, future Hall of Famer, in my opinion, Joel Embiid came in in the 2016, 17 season after missing the first two years with a broken foot, uh, Ben Simmons was drafted. He broke his foot, obviously his first year and then came back the next year. So, I mean, how promising was that team, especially for you as a broadcaster, to were you excited? How excited were you going into the start of the Simmons and Embiid era? That's kind of gone since after you retired. Now, but mm -hmm. before that, how was those couple of years broadcasting those two? Well, you had two guys who were all stars and could be the centerpiece of your team for at least the next decade, presuming that you re-signed them and everything mm -hmm. remained copacetic, and so. Uh, it was tremendously exciting. It actually was exciting, Nick, before that time while I, uh, MB was recovering because we watched him grow from college freshman to a grown man. Yeah. And we saw him beasting in practice and just eating up anybody who got in his way. And so even before he played his first game, we all just kind of winked at each other and said, you know, this young guy is going to really be something special yeah. if he turned out to be. So, you know, fate being what it is, it's unfortunate that Ben Simmons didn't work out for whatever reason. But, um, you know, I think back to that Jimmy Butler team. Yeah. And had the four bouncer gone the other way and the Sixers perhaps prevailed in overtime, you could mm -hmm. what if yourself to death, of course. Would they have kept that team together? Yeah. How would it have done? Uh, but like a lot of things in life, when you take one road, you never know what the other road would have been. Yeah, like. they possibly could have won the finals that year too. But yeah, I guess oh that's, yeah, that's a whole nother story. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I'll ask you about your actual broadcast. So, in your career, this might be a tough question, but what was your favorite player to broadcast? One as a Sixer, and two, not a Sixer as an opponent mm -hmm. team. So, clearly, Iverson and I, I think, are linked 
just mm -hmm. in terms of me being the soundtrack for much of what he did when yeah. he was here. Uh, certainly as the halftime guy, my first year was the 82, 83 team with Julia serving Moses mm -hmm. Malone on the finals. Yeah. All those guys, Andrew, Tony, Mo cheeks. I mean, that, that, that team was, uh, was not only tremendous. I mean, hall of famers and, and all of that stuff. So, um, that was one of my favorite teams as well. And then it just had to be Michael Jordan only because yeah. I do believe that, uh, he still is. Although if LeBron could somehow eke out one more title, yeah um and put himself in the conversation because of everything else that he's done um i i think jordan is the goat still mm -hmm. and don't forget as a fan i got to watch will chamberlain play yeah so in all his dominance he was a very special player in his time now i'll ask you about his 100 point game a big thing in the nba is conspiracy theories did that game happen oh my goodness yes uh, there were plenty of eyewitnesses and in fact what I did was, because I never saw the game, in spite of the fact that 900,000 other people do claim that they were yeah. there, <laughs> I was able to interview Bill Campbell, who was the broadcaster. I was able to interview Harvey Pollack, the longtime stat man for the Sixers, who was the stat guy for the Warriors then. And I interviewed the man who is responsible for the only visual evidence of that game, and that's an AP photographer uh, named Paul Vathis, who just happened to be at the game with his son, saw that Wilt was about to score 100 and rushed out to his car to get his camera mm -hmm. to take some of the pictures that you've seen where Wilt's shaking hands with some fans on the court. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry. No Wilt is not only shaking hands with some fans on the court, but he's um, uh, holding up that that famous yeah. 100 sign. And so, uh, yeah, uh, listen, most of the people who attended that game have probably passed, but... Um, no, that game happened, and yeah. the conspiracy theories are uh, are out the window. I'm afraid. Yeah, so you heard it here. Um, <laughs> so uh, I didn't I, realize it was such a big deal, and yeah. I had to. Uh, it's very big, uh, I guess, conspiracy. Uh, the, okay, but um, my 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 thing about conspiracy theorists is uh, what proof do they have? Yeah, that number one yeah. and number two, um, a lot of people have to be kept, um, in secret. You know, they have yeah. to not divulge what it is that they allegedly know as conspirists. And so um, that's my feeling. Conspiracy yeah, theories. so I feel like I sh should ask every broadcaster I ever talked to. Um, this might be a tough question, but what's your favorite call you've ever had in your whole career? It doesn't matter what sport. It doesn't have to be Sixers. Um, yeah, it's funny you would say that because uh, in filling in, I think it was either for Gene or for Mike Emmerich there. There was a flyer who, uh, well, yeah, there was a game at Boston. They won two to one. And um, I just remember there was a, a goal by the Flyers uh, toward the end of the game that gave them the win. Um, Sixers, almost anything game winning, I guess you might say. The uh, TJ McConnell one, I think, was yeah. my favorite of the game winners when uh, they beat cool. the Knicks. Yep. I was watching that game live, actually. Um so you're very famous for your sayings as well. We're coming in for landing, uh, many other ones. What's your favorite that uh, you would say? Did you have one? Actually, I, I, it was probably garbage into gold because I hear from people the most about that one. Yeah. I actually had it um, copyrighted. Really? Yeah. Okay. And we put it on sweatshirts and T-shirts and sold them and donated proceeds some of the proceeds to charity mm -hmm. so i would say that is probably my favorite and i just remember one day george lynch putting an offensive rebound back in for two points and garbage out of garbage in the gold came out of my mouth and that yeah. was it so if you could go back in your career and to a great moment in your broadcast career and change the call that you made what would it be and why <laughs> If well, yeah, I guess I could I, I know the exact place. So there was a game where Allen Iverson stole an inbounds pass, raced about 60 feet and beat the clock, got a layup, gave the Sixers the win. So two things happened there. One, my voice cracked while he was on his way to the hoop. And the other thing was that I was yelling, 
he won the game, he won the game, he won the game, where, in fact, there were a few tenths of a second remaining, and there, oh, no. I think, was, you know, the possibility for the other team to yeah. get a lob to the hoop and do something. So um, that would be the one call that I would like to have back. Yeah, so I'll go to after you retired. Now you're here at Temple teaching a class um, called Play-by-Play -play Announcing, and now you're teaching a different one this semester. So um, I heard about that one kid, Nick Parr. Yeah, name is. Nicholas Parr, yeah. <laughs> Nicholas no, Parr. Just kidding. Um, how has that class been going for you? I mean, you like teaching at your alma mater? It uh, Well, it, it the whole thing is a, is a dream come true when you consider that I am – teaching where I was a student, number yeah. one, and number two, I'm teaching something that was uh, something I did for my entire life, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started when I was a kid, turning the sound down of the TV and doing games into a tape yeah. recorder, so it was, uh, yeah, this whole thing has really been cool. I, I've lived my best life, Nick, and I don't yeah. know how it is that I did it, but I'm glad that I did. Well, thank you. That, that's, that's all the questions that I've got, so thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, and that'll be the show. All right. Thank you. Yeah.